tales for dark nights. Milk and Cookies Written by L. Chan Narrated by Todd Farrell This isn't actually my story. It was related to me a while ago by an elderly gentleman that frequented a convenience store I worked at. I think back to that night where I followed him to the junkyard and my hair still stands along with that quiver of goose flesh that has nothing to do with the temperature. I worked in a relatively quiet part of the city out on the edge and we had little to fear from crime. The job didn't pay well, but what little I got helped to pay some of the bills for college, and the nightly customers were few and far between, giving me more than enough time to do some reading or languish on the internet. Now, you think that we don't notice people when we're behind the till. We do. We just don't give a shit, mostly. We can tell when we should card someone, or that desperate, almost slimy look of lust on the face of a young man buying condoms at eleven in the evening. Then there was the old man. He showed up every Friday like clockwork. He wore a flannel shirt with the rolled up sleeves that had seen one wash too many, and he counted out his change with the reluctance of one used to thrift. He was polite, that old man, always a warm hello and thank you after he left with his purchase. He was stooped with age, but there was steel in that spine, I could tell and he always bought the same thing, a small packet of milk and a little paper bag of cookies. A strange thing for an old man to buy, a doting grandparent, perhaps, but I never saw him enter the shop with another soul. This piqued my curiosity. Boredom has a way of amplifying novelty. Through the long evenings, I counted cracks on the ceiling, arranged merchandise in strange geometric shapes, saw patterns in the repeating squares of the linoleum floor. This strange man vexed me. Milk and cookies, a treat for a young child, yet purchased late in the night. Was he perhaps reliving some long-forgotten time in his youth whilst partaking in these goodies? Dark paranoia raised its head. Perhaps the old man was one of those psychotic perverts that kidnapped young girls and raised them in his basement. Week after week, we swapped perfunctory greetings, exchanged merchandise for cash. I couldn't unravel the mystery. I couldn't read it in his roomy eyes, his shaking hands or his slow gait. I couldn't take it, this strangeness. I decided to follow him. It took me a few weeks to plan. I'd pop my head out and track him down the street until the first turn. Then I'd lock the front door and trail him to the next turn, and so on. One day, soon after he'd made his regular purchase, I made my move. Quickly locking up, I followed him at a distance, never too close, never more than a block away. There was a feeling of the forbidden in what I was doing, a little like being a child again and doing something naughty. He never suspected a thing. The streetlights gave us both long, twisted shadows as I chased him through the dark streets. He found his destination in an old junkyard, practically a landfill. The rusty chain clanged to the floor after he gave it a gentle tug. Nothing worth stealing here, it seemed. The old man walked in confidently, and I had to hurry to catch up. I quickly lost him in that maze, wandering amidst the piles of society's detritus. The light and sounds of the city faded in the distance, the half-moon in the sky giving everything an unearthly silvery sheen. 
The panic was there, only a heartbeat away, in that strange, alien landscape. I had nearly given up hope when I finally chanced upon a small clearing, my erstwhile quarry sitting there on the dirt, showing his yellowing teeth in a wry smile. It took you long enough to catch up, he said. I stopped short. I had nothing to say. Come here, kid. There's nothing to fear here. I reckon something's got your interest all fired up. That's why you followed me here. You'll get in no trouble for this? The owner trusts me. She knows I don't steal, and I'm okay to close the shop early if business is slow. Slow enough that you'd spend half the night playing spy to hunt down an old codger like me. He laughed, a dry, wheezing series of exhalations that broke into coughs. I'm here, he said, pressing his forearms against his creaking knees to get to his feet, to keep a promise, uh, an old, old promise. I come here every week because that's all I got left. Ain't much left in the world for me, no wife, no kids, no job. But a man's got to be true to his word. If he don't got that little bit left, well, then he ain't much of a man, is he? I had to nod to keep him going. He gestured at something behind him, shifting out of the way to let me see. A pair of pale doors jutted out from the junk, looking so much like the entrance to some ancient crypt. The old man pulled one of the doors open. The shriek of the hinges carrying through the still night air. Even from a distance, I took in the thickness of that door. I quickly closed the distance between us. The man placed the milk and cookies behind the threshold of the door and pulled it shut. He reached out a hand in greeting and introduced himself as Miller. He didn't say if that was his first or last name. Back of a refrigerator truck, he said, giving the door a slap. The doll's smack again reminded me of how thick the walls were. I guess you're curious as to why I'm here every week. It's a long story and one I haven't told to many people. I'm old now, ain't got many years left. My bones ache in the rain, and it hurts more and more every day. Guess it's worth telling. His voice seemed to gain strength, a rich baritone instead of the weak, cracked sounds earlier. This was back in the old days, before the Second World War. I never served, of course, too young then. I must have been nine, maybe ten years of age. We didn't have all these new-fangled toys and computer thingies. He pronounced the unfamiliar word slowly, his jaw working around the edges of the syllables that you have nowadays. Back then, we'd play wherever we could. Cowboys and engines, cops and robbers. No television, either. That was for the rich folk. This yard has been here longer than I have. We had forts on hills of trash, played soldiers, everything kids ought to be doing. That day was hide-and-seek. An old old game, but a great one for a place like this. I wasn't a big kid, didn't win at most of the games we played, but I was going to win this one. I'd seen this big old refrigerator unit here before, right on the edge of the yard back then and I knew exactly where I was going to be hiding. I was small, yeah, but I was a fast one. May not look like it now, but I got away from the pack of them even before the count had reached twenty. Didn't want no one else to hide in here with me. It was dark in there. Cool, too. Before I closed the door, I could see that some of the junk had made its way into the truck unit over time. Last thing I remember seeing was that one line of daylight 
before I pulled this here door shut. At first, there was nothing but the sound of my breathing bouncing off the walls. I imagined that I would always win at hide-and-seek from then on. I counted breaths and heartbeats till I got bored. Then I realized there wasn't a handle on the inside. I could see his hand starting to shake as he remembered that old fear. He clenched his fists to stop the shakes, and when the bald fists themselves started quivering, he put his hands in his pockets. It took me a while to realize the game was over. I'd been in the dark for a long time. Too long. I threw my entire weight at the door. I hit the walls till my hands were bloody. I screamed till my throat hurt. His Adam's apple bobbed up and down as he swallowed at the memory. Then I sat to wait. I must have fallen asleep. <laughs> How can you tell if you're asleep when you're all alone in the darkness? You can't, boy. You can't. I got thirsty first. Then hungry. It's the only way I knew time was passing. I felt the hope go out like the sun setting. I yelled in that dark place. I called out to God, but he didn't answer. I would have called out to old Nick himself if I had dared. I cried. For hours there in the dark I cried, the sound bouncing off of those thick walls, till the air was filled with the sound of tears and sobs. I thought I was going to die. You ever been close to death, boy? No, sir. I shook my head. He fixed his eyes on mine, those almost cloudy eyes, suddenly sharper. No, you haven't. I can tell when a man's looked death in the eyes. He just ain't the same after that. It was a trick of the echo, I thought at first, but I swore there was another person crying in there with me. It sounded a, a little higher, a little further away than my own voice. This was it, I told myself. I'd been in the dark so long that I was going batshit crazy. I counted to five and held my breath, and still the crying continued. I was rapt. The man was looking at me, but not looking at me. The dreamy half-focus of his eyes told me he was seeing something else, something far away. I called out in the dark. At first, there was no answer but that quiet sobbing. It was another child, but not a boy, a little girl. There was enough light before I shut the door to know I was alone in there. I was panicking a second before, but now I felt a creeping fear. The crying started up again. I backed myself into the corner next to the door. You ever seen a mouse in a cage trap when it tries to get away from you? Yeah, like that. The crying didn't get any closer. I figured I was dead in there anyway. Nobody was coming to get me. So I called out again. The crying stopped. There in the dark, the little girl answered. She sounded like she was about my age as well. She told me her name was Helen. A pretty name, even then. She'd been stuck there in the dark for a long time. She tried calling out for help once, but no one came. She got really hungry. Then she wasn't so hungry no more. She'd given up on calling for help, on seeing her family, of ever having another friend. The walls, she said, were too thick for any sound to escape and nobody would ever know that I was in there. 
Nobody'd ever found her. One good thing, at least she wouldn't have to be lonely anymore since she had me. I heard her shifting there in the dark, and she held my hand. Her hand was small, and it was cold, like she'd put it in the freezer for a few minutes. But it was all I had, and I squeezed it with all my strength. I dreamt that there were voices outside, calling my name. I wasn't sure about it until I squeezed my ear to the corner of the door. The lining must have been rotted with age because I could still hear something from outside. If I could hear them, maybe they could hear me. I tried to scream, to shout. All that came out was a tiny croak. I'd been too long without water. I tried to wet my tongue with spit, but even that failed. I slapped at the door with my free hand. The time without food and drink had left me weak. I wasn't sure that they could hear anything from me. Hope died there a second time. That dark box was going to be the last thing I ever saw, and nobody would know. I felt Helen's little hand tighten around mine. Don't go, she told me. Stay, it'll be fun. I've been alone for so long. She started to pull me back into the depths of that dark place. I couldn't fight her. She felt so strong. Please, I whispered to her. My parents will miss me. I still have friends outside. Even with her tiny nails drawing blood from my hand, I could feel her sadness through that tiniest bit of contact that we had. I have no more friends. Her crying started again, soft in that place, so sad that it seemed her heart would burst from it. I can be your friend. Help me. I promise I'll be your friend forever. I told her, and I meant it. I saw the old man's hand flex in his pocket, remembering that ghostly touch. She let go. Or maybe she was never there. I touched my hand to my cheek, and it was still cold. Just then, I heard the door open. I'd been found. Strong hands lifted me out of the dark. The light hurt my eyes, and it was a while before I could see my rescuers. Someone brought water. I gulped it down. It was the best thing I had ever tasted. No water's ever tasted the same since. Tasted like life, you know? They sent for my parents as I sat there with the big man who'd found me. He sized me up with a squint, said I was bigger than he'd thought. The voice he'd heard was much higher, almost like a girl's cry. He messed up my hair with one huge, rough hand. No shame in crying in there, boy, he said. If I was stuck there, I'd be scared too. My parents came to see me, brought over by the police. They scooped me up with big hugs. We were going to leave when I asked if they'd found the girl in there with me. The rescuers looked puzzled. I'd been the only one in the refrigerator truck. I wouldn't leave until they took another look. I kicked up such a fuss that they just exchanged looks of frustration and brought me back to those huge doors. They threw them open. No girl came out. The light didn't reach all the way to the back. One of the cops took out a flashlight, one of those big silver ones. You don't see them around anymore. The trash of the junkyard had found its way into that old refrigerator truck. It was only on his second sweep of that unnatural cave that he saw the bright blue of a girl's dress. (sighs) He sighed deeply, his tail near its end. He suddenly looked very frail, as though the telling had 
leached the very life from him. She'd been dead for years, of course. All dried out like one of them mummies from the National Geographic. I think I went a little crazy when I saw her. I don't know what I said, but nobody believed me. Been in the dark too long, they said, apt to drive a boy mad. But I never stopped believing, and I never forgot my promise. Seventy years it's been. What transpires between us, well, that's just for me and me alone to know. I've not always been able to come here, but I've tried my best, which is more than some men can say. He leaned against the door, out of breath after the sharing. He straightened up and cleared his throat, still with one hand on the thick metal. Good night, friend. I will see you again next week. His voice was suddenly clear again, and the sound rang out across the junkyard. I half opened my mouth to return his farewell before I realized that his eyes weren't on me. No, they were focused on the door instead. He slowly made his way across that clearing. I stood up, also leaning against the door for support. Sir, you forgot your milk and cookies, I called out to the man, now all the way across the clearing. He looked back, and again I could tell he was not looking at me, but at the doors I was leaning against. No, boy, I did not. A good evening to you, too, and I will see you next week. A strange encounter, I thought. The unease I had felt with the telling of the story sloughed off me. A simple campfire tale, nothing more. Just some old man, probably addled with dementia, living out some half-imagined childhood fantasy. I sighed. The moon was already high overhead. I suppose that there were worse ways to spend an evening. One thing niggled at me, just before I turned to find my way from that still place. For the second time that evening, the refrigerator doors were pulled open. A wave of stale air belched out. I half expected to see Helen's bones still laid out after all these years. There was nothing there. I chided myself for my childish fears, giving a nervous laugh. Nothing in the empty crypt of the refrigerator truck but an empty milk packet and cookie crumbs. Six Crows Written by Daniel Davis Narrated by Jeff Clement There were six crows in that telephone wire. Rick glanced at his wife, who still had her face pressed against the passenger side window. What? On that telephone wire back there. There were six crows. Rick struggled for something to say. A witty comment or resentful retort. Instead, he grunted and returned his attention to the road. After a few seconds, Marie looked at him. Did you hear me? You mean about the crows? Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. Don't you think that's odd? Rick tried to find something in her eyes. Some proof that she was baiting him. Some sign that she was trying to make him look like a fool in front of their daughter again. What he saw made him frown. Marie looked worried. What's wrong? There were six crows on that telephone wire. She repeated. Rick swallowed, turned back to the road, and watched as one telephone pole replaced another. He felt Marie stare, but not the way she used to look at him. In the beginning, it had been sexy. Now it was annoying. Carefully, he said, I don't get it. Didn't you ever hear the rhyme? Apparently not. My grandmother taught it to me when I was little. And she learned it when she was little, back in England. 
I don't remember it exactly, but it said something like different numbers of crows meant different things. Like three crows would mean good luck or something. (laughs) Does six crows mean we win the lottery? In the back seat, Chelsea giggled. Rick glanced at her in the rearview mirror. Thanks, honey. Daddy loves to have an audience. Rick. Yes, dear? Six crows are unlucky. Very unlucky. Uh Uh-huh. Rick didn't have to fight back to laughter. After seven years, he simply knew better than to laugh. That was the fourth grouping of six crows that I've seen in the past hour. Good thing it wasn't the sixth group. Then we'd really be screwed. You don't think that's a little disturbing? Marie, what I think is that your powers of observation are astounding. You managed to count how many crows were grouped together on a telephone wire while passing them at 60 miles per hour. Not only that, but I didn't even see the damn things. Are you saying I imagined it? He couldn't help himself. No, I'm saying only you would care. Rick. She let her voice trail off. The one good thing about their marriage, they had learned when to pick their fights. Whenever Chelsea was around was not an appropriate time. Still, their daughter could sense when something was wrong. In the rearview mirror, Rick saw Chelsea facing out the window, her eyes squinted. He knew how awkward it was trying to distance herself from the tension in front of her. He remembered feeling that way as a kid. It had been hell. Returning his attention to the road, Rick wondered how much further they had to go before they got out of Nebraska. The Atlas was in the back seat, highways highlighted in orange and pink, indicating an intricate pattern across the country. Perhaps the scenic drive hadn't been the best choice. It was taking far too long, and the Rockies wouldn't be in sight for another day or two at least. The interstate wouldn't have offered as many interesting detours, just the typical tourist destinations, but it would have gotten them there quicker and more efficiently. Rick found the two-lane highways at least during the stretches through fields of wheat, corn, and hay, boring. He felt drowsy and out of it. In a couple hours, he had to turn the wheel over to Marie, who was, if nothing else, a competent navigator. At least the weather was in their favor. Two days earlier, they had found themselves driving through a severe thunderstorm. Chelsea had been in tears worried about tornadoes. Rick had placed the idea in her head and spent most of that hour mentally berating himself for it. Marie had to pull over, give the wheel over to Rick, and climb into the back with their daughter. She hadn't chewed Rick out that time. They'd both known it had been his fault. Marie had always been an artist with guilt. She knew when to lay it on, and when to let it creep up at its own pace. The day was pleasant. Perhaps that was because the car was air-conditioned. Rick had experienced some horrible summers on the East Coast, but nothing prepared him for the barrenness of the Midwest. There were no trees, hills, or skyscrapers to block the sun. The heat was not a byproduct of the sunlight. It was the sunlight unfiltered and uncompromising. The grass could take it. The grass and wheat were light enough to catch what little breeze blew across the fields, to sway in its brief reprieve. But a man standing out there would feel nothing but the blistering heat. We're in the middle of God's asshole, Rick thought, laughing. Marie's grandmother had been good for more than counting crows, She'd been a delightful dinner table conversationalist, with enough witticisms to start her own quotations dictionary. What's so funny? Marie asked. Rick noted that there was no hostility in her voice, only mild curiosity. (laughs) Nothing, he said. He just got me thinking about Helen. 
Marie smiled. You hear that, Chelsea? Daddy's thinking of Grandma Miller. <laughs> Grandma Miller. Chelsea said in a low, throaty growl, an imitation of a voice roughened by too many cigarettes. That'd be her, Rick said. She of the varicose veins and halitosis. What's that? You'll find out in a few years, sweetheart. We'll also have to discuss hernias, hemorrhoids, and crow's feet. Instantly, Rick regretted what he said. He glanced carefully at Marie. Yes, the amusement was gone from her face, but her smile remained. Do you remember her chicken and dumplings? Rick asked, rushing the words out faster than he should have. Good lord, I could have lived off them. And her banana cookies. Chelsea said from the back seat. Yeah, those too. And her raspberry pie. Rick added, smiling. Marie winced. Ew. Hey, you liked it. I pretended to like it to make her happy. Marie said. I call BS, dear. You ate it with gusto. You stopped liking it when you tried out the recipe. Rick told her. She always said the main ingredient was love. Doesn't mean you should skimp on the salt. I just thought we should try eating a little healthier. Marie said. You didn't like the spare tire you were getting, remember? Sorry I don't make enough to afford a gym membership. Daddy, what's that? Rick glanced into the rearview mirror. Chelsea was pointing at the windshield. He looked forward. Rick slammed on the brakes at the sight of something shiny in the middle of the road. Shit! Rick jerked the steering wheel to the right. The Toyota refused to turn with him. The car left the road, hit the gravel, and then drove headfirst into the ditch that separated the highway from the fields. The car came to a halt, the back bumper a couple of feet higher than the front. Rick stared out the windshield at the tall grass just a few feet in front of him, swaying back and forth. Damn it! He put the car in reverse. The wheels spun. Rick. He tried again. God damn it! Rick! He glanced at his wife. She placed a tentative hand on his shoulder. Honey, turn the car off. He stared at her for a moment, then did as she asked. He couldn't think of anything else to do. Marie unbuckled her seatbelt. Chelsea, honey, are you alright? Mommy. Rick ripped his seatbelt out of the buckle and turned around. Chelsea appeared to be okay. She was frightened, more so than she had been a couple days ago during the storm, but otherwise unharmed. Comfort was Marie's department. His wife had always been good with that. What the fuck was that? Rick! Jesus, I'm sorry. Marie, who had climbed into the back seat with their daughter, glared at him over Chelsea's tangled blonde hair. I don't know what it was. Maybe you should have been watching the road? Chelsea's crying kicked up a notch. Rick focused his attention at the hayfield. A retort sat at the tip of his tongue, but... She was right. He should have been watching the road. He wiped sweat from his face, and as he did, he noticed stubble grating against his palm. He took off his glasses and rubbed his temple. He racked his mind, trying to figure out what he could do. Rick turned the car on, and immediately cool, brisk relief filled the vehicle. He angled a vent directly on his face. He needed a second to cool off and collect his thoughts. After a few moments of silence, Rick calmed down, Chelsea's sobs subsided, and Marie's panting slowed, though he still felt her stare. The argument would be moved until later, reserved until they checked into the next motel. That suited him just fine. He looked in both side view mirrors, trying to see the object he'd run over. All he saw, though, was sky. I should check how bad it is, he said. See what we hit. Marie didn't say anything. 
By the way her jaw clenched, he could tell she'd wanted him out of the car. He couldn't blame her. Rick opened the door and stepped out, falling a few more inches than he expected. The heat didn't hit him as much as engulf him. As soon as he was outside the Toyota, the air conditioning became a distant memory. The sun, beating down on him with no clouds to absorb the blow, became everything. He shut the door behind him, purposely refusing to look into the back seat as he checked to make sure none of the tires had blown, then scrambled up the ditch and onto the highway. The object that had caused him to derail the trustworthy Toyota lay a few yards down the highway. Rick shambled over to it. He stared at the object, cocking his head to the side, trying to figure out what it was. Some piece of metal, maybe from a tire or muffler. Awful shiny muffler, he thought. It wasn't anything, just an anonymous piece of thin metal, a few inches long, with one sharp end. He picked it up, turned it over in his hands, and threw it into the field. Fuck it, he thought as he walked back to the car. Marie rolled the window down in the back. What did we hit? We didn't. Thank God. Well, what was it? Rick shrugged. She rolled the window back up and turned back to their daughter. He stood at the back of the car, thinking about how hot it was and how tired he was from driving. He knew he would have to push the car on top of everything else. To that purpose, he hollered to Marie, Pop the trunk! She did, and he began taking out their suitcases and setting them safely aside. He didn't know if it would help at all, probably not, but it gave him something to do while he prepared himself for the labor ahead. Once the trunk was emptied, he slammed it shut and walked back to the driver's side. As he climbed into the car, the air conditioning caressed his skin. His sweat dried almost instantly, leaving him shivering. Rick relished every second of it, leaning back in the seat, eyes closed. Everything okay? Marie asked. He opened his eyes as if waking from a deep sleep. Part of him hoped to see the road, a gas station, or a hotel. Instead, all he saw out his windshield was hay. He turned around in his seat. Marie was no longer holding their daughter. Chelsea sat beside her, flipping through one of the books she'd brought. Her eyes scanned the page intently. Rick felt a moment of pride watching his daughter read, thinking perhaps she may even become an English teacher like him although hopefully she'd wind up someplace more prestigious than Clarkview Middle. His eyes shifted from his daughter to Marie, who glared at him with furrowed brows. What are we going to do? I need to push this car out of the ditch. Can you do that? If you're sitting here with it in reverse, yeah, probably. Can't you just call a tow truck? I thought you said we don't have any reception out here. She sighed. The phone's there, beside you. Check. Rick picked up the phone. Hmm. No signal. There's gotta be a farmhouse around here. He coughed. (laughs) Wanna get out there and search for it? Probably miles down the road, either way. How about flagging someone down? How many cars do you remember us passing? I don't know. You can count crows, but not cars. I counted four. That's... Four in the past two hours. This isn't a highway so much as it is a skid mark. We're alone out here. She smiled at him. It's scenic though, isn't it? Maybe Chelsea can go up the road and see if she can wave down a busload of cheerleaders or something. Chelsea giggled. Okay, Daddy. Rick smiled. The three of them stepped outside the car. Marie gasped in the heat. Rick was surprised how much his body seemed to have forgotten it so quickly. We ain't in Kansas anymore. Though, it looks about the same. As Chelsea disappeared over the hill, Rick called out, 
Make sure you ask those cheerleaders if they have any beer with them. Okay. She called back down, laughing. Marie turned to him. Out there in the sun, she looked her age. Not that she was old. Neither of them were old. But she wasn't a young co-ed anymore, either. She didn't have a 20-year-old's body or grace. Certainly no college girl had those crow's feet. The sunlight seemed to highlight the creases in her face, the imperfections in her skin. He figured it was doing the same to him, an equal opportunity humiliation. She pulled her hair back and let it fall limp against her shoulders. God, it's hot. You said it, Rick agreed. Marie looked up the road. She's okay up there, right? She's better than us, he nodded. We've got work to do. When I pound on the hood, throw it in reverse. Don't stomp on the pedal. Just let it down gradually. I want to see how this thing's going to react. Marie got in and closed the door. Rick heard the soft purr of the automatic window rolling down as he walked to the front of the car. He leaned against the hood, putting some force into it. The car rocked. The push would take a lot of time, and he would be far too exhausted to drive to the next town. Marie could, though, assuming that there even is a town. Of course there's a town, he muttered. Ready? She asked. Sorry, this fucking heat. <sighs> Remember, when I pound on the hood, throw her in reverse. I was paying attention. Amazing the patience you learned after seven years of marriage. They'd been together two years before that, but patience had never really been a part of their relationship. They'd been too busy with school and sex. There had been love, of that he had no doubt. But love had complicated things. The first year of marriage hadn't been much different. They'd lived together before tying the knot, so they became accustomed to each other's bad habits. Even when the baby came, things had been going strong. When had it gone downhill? After the move? Clarkview wasn't the city. They had agreed the city wasn't the place to raise Chelsea. That was one of the few things they still agreed on. But Clarksville wasn't exactly the suburban life that Marie had in mind. Maybe they would have been happier elsewhere. Wick couldn't come up with a specific moment when he realized his marriage was ending. It was as though he'd always known it, which wasn't true at all. As a kid, watching his parents' marriage fizzle then explode, he'd promised he would never do the same thing. He would marry for life. And he had. He really had. He got his mind trailing, wiped sweat from his forehead, and slammed his palm onto the hood. After he heard the engine accelerate, he pressed his shoulder against the front grille. Marie put the car in reverse and revved the engine. The car moved an inch or two, but quickly settled back into place. Marie leaned out the window. You okay? Yeah. What? Yeah. Just give me a second. You really think you can push this thing up from here? Yeah, I can do it. Rick pounded on the hood and placed both hands against the grill of the car, wincing at the radiating heat. He pushed hard as Marie revved the engine, and the car moved a few inches, enough for him to step forward. He pushed again until his foot slipped in the grass and he fell. Fuck! He yelled as his cheek contacted the hot steel. Rick slid to the ground, grateful he didn't pull anything on his way. He rested against the bumper, breathing heavily. You okay? <sighs> I'm alright. One more go, he said as he stood and prepared to push once more. It actually took three more tries. Inch by inch, they maneuvered the vehicle into a better position. By the end of it, Rick stripped his shirt off and was covered in sweat and grime. 
Marie reversed the car the rest of the way from the ditch until the tires finally took hold and the car jerked backwards. As he climbed the small incline, Rick fell again, but this time softly into grass and dirt. Rick heard Marie exit the car and call for him again. Between the sun and the exhaustion from pushing, he wanted to lie there. But there was something different in the way she called his name. He sat up, waiting for her to come to his side of the road. What is it? Where's Chelsea? He stood and looked around. She's not with you? Marie's voice became panic-stricken. Why the hell would I ask where she was if she was with me? He watched her march toward the opposite side of the road and look back. He stopped himself from running after her. Running would mean there was a reason to run. Once on the road, he saw Marie a few yards away, pacing back and forth across the highway, looking down the other side. Chelsea? Rick yelled. Chelsea? Marie repeated. Marie turned back to him, wild-eyed. They both took turns calling out Chelsea's name without a response. Finally, Marie snapped. Rick, where is she? Tears streamed down her face. She was here! Rick screamed. She was right fucking here! Chelsea! Come here right this instant! Panic won. Rick ran, rechecking everywhere, his eyes following the path of the hay. Did she get back in the car? Marie asked, hopeful. The car. Yes, she had to be in the car. He hadn't heard her climb back inside, but then he'd been exerting himself, pushing it out of the ditch. He hadn't heard the door open, that's all. Hadn't heard it close, either. He simply hadn't noticed. And neither had Marie, but she'd been caught up in what they were doing, too. They both took off in a run. Marie flung open the passenger door, screaming. Chelsea? Rick watched her lift her hands to her mouth and step back from the car. Oh my god. What? He ripped open the opposing door. She's not here. Rick opened the trunk and dropped to his knees, ignoring the pain that shot up as the hot pavement raised his skin. She wasn't under the car, either. Chelsea Elizabeth Palmer, you come here right now! Marie yelled, fists balled to her sides. Chelsea! Rick took a deep breath and yelled again. Chelsea! He ran back into the middle of the road. No sign of her. Rick! The tone of her voice changed again. What? He said as he took a step towards her. Look! Rick followed where her fingers pointed, expecting to see Chelsea pop out of the grass. But instead, his eyes rested on a telephone pole with birds perched along the wires. Crows. He counted six. Six crows. God damn it, Marie! Rick lashed out, furious. Rick, that rhyme! He had to slow down before he lost his mind. His gaze shifted from the crows to the grass below. Rick's eyes narrowed as he stepped forward. Behind him, he heard her mumbling something, but he ignored it and moved on a little faster. There was a break in the hay. Small, but still visible. The edge was distorted as if something had broken through. After a moment of steering, he comprehended what he was looking at. A hole in the dried grass. And he saw something else, too. Rick ran, stumbling down the ditch and landing on his knees in front of the hay. Marie was immediately behind him. They both stared, but not at the hole. Rather, what was in it and all around the hole. What's that? She asked, her voice trembling. Rick 
didn't answer. He continued to stare at what he knew was blood. It's not hers. We're in the country. That blood could belong to anything. Except they were alone out here. And the blood was fresh. They moved towards the small entrance. Marie dropped down to her knees beside him. Rick barely noticed. He stared hard into the hole, noticing how it seemed like someone had been dragged into it. Signs of a struggle. The words resonated in his head for a moment. And then it all clicked. Chelsea's in there. If she's bleeding, she's alive. Rick pushed Marie aside and broke into a run. He parted the tall grass as he took each long, hard step. It was easy to tell where she'd been. The hay grass was trampled, disorderly, unkempt. There was a trail, a path cut through the field, more or less straight on. Worse than anything, he followed a path of blood, left like a trail of breadcrumbs. He didn't see Chelsea anywhere. He thought about going back for some kind of weapon, but he had already wasted enough time. Marie gasped from somewhere behind him. She tried to keep up, but he forged on without waiting. I'll get her, he said, hoping she would have the wits to turn back and flag someone down. This can't be happening. Rick thought clearly enough to know that despite his panic, despite the time he was losing, he needed to move carefully. If he ran too fast, he might lose track of the path. He went on, one long stride in front of the other. Grass brushed at his arms, face, and chest. A grove of trees, a hundred or so yards away, caught his attention. He couldn't tell from that far back, but figured it was where the trail led. That's where she would go, or whoever, whatever, had her wood. It was the only thing out there besides the goddamn highway. Thoughts berated his mind, trying to loop him into a panic. He imagined worst-case scenarios, but he fought past it as he cut through the grass, still following the blood trail. He pushed on, the clearing not far. Tears stung his eyes. He stopped for a second to listen. Marie was stumbling through the trail, crying. Flies buzzed around his ears. Beetles crawled on his shorts and legs. One crow is unlucky. Marie's voice came from behind him. Rick tried to ignore her and started moving a little faster than before. He followed the path, each blade of grass splattered by a painter's brush. Rick wondered how much blood Chelsea had in her. Then he wondered why he would even think such a thing. Two crows. Lucky. He heard her say. She was on his heels now. He sped up, the clearing not much further. He tried not to notice her. He tried hard to ignore her words. Three is... health. She said louder. Between the blood, heat, and Marie losing her mind, panic won. Four is wealth. Her ragged voice screamed. Running was illogical. He needed to slow down. He needed to think. He needed to conserve his strength. But logic was a thing of the past. Logic did not belong beneath a sun that knew neither joy nor pity. Logic belonged in the air-conditioned safety of the Toyota, while his daughter tried in vain to ignore her parents' bickering. Logic belonged back on the East Coast, in a house that was coming apart at the seams. The field opened to a grove of trees, an oasis in the patchwork. Rick stumbled into it, and Marie collapsed on the ground beside him, half in and half out of the grassy hill. Five is sickness, she managed to say. Marie regained her feet. Her breath was sharp and jagged. Rick saw she was staring towards the trees and followed her gaze to the center of the grove. 
Her gasps grew shriller until they petered out into half sobs. If it weren't for Marie, he wouldn't have seen the animal staring at them. It stood several yards away beside a cluster of small trees grown thick together, its body tense, ready to attack. Rick didn't know if it was a jackal, wolf, or coyote, but he understood why his wife was hyperventilating. He knew as soon as he saw the canine. Blood coated its muzzle. Rick yelled. It was instinctive, primal. No conscious thought, just a buildup of air and a compression of the lungs. It must have been menacing enough, because the beast, a coyote, yes, it had to be a coyote, darted off in the opposite direction. The animal didn't make a sound as it dodged trees and exposed roots, its tan body disappearing like a shadow in the dark. Rick and Marie stood still, staring at where the coyote vanished. Images of the dog snatching his daughter from the road flashed through his mind. He took a step, knowing a pack of coyotes might be watching him from the shadows. Then he took another, and another, each one cautious, each one forced by whatever willpower remained in his body. When Marie spoke again, he wanted to turn around and strangle her, to tell her she was a lying bitch, but all he could do was let the immensity of her words sink into his flesh like an anchor. Sick is... is death. Rick reached the spot where the coyote had been. He turned so he could see behind the trees and stared down. Then he crouched carefully and reached out a hand, but quickly brought it back to his side. He stared until tears blurred his vision. He looked away, blinking at a tree a few yards to his right. There, in the top few branches were a bunch of crows, all of them seeming to stare at him with black, accusing eyes. Rick couldn't help it. He didn't want to. But what he wanted didn't matter anymore. It hadn't mattered since the car had swerved off the highway into the fields that were now his prison. He counted the crows and began to scream. Written by Gareth Shaw. Performed by Alicia Pavlis. Featuring David Lewis Richardson and Peter Bishop. Audio production and music by Jeff Clement. With their black clothing and hats jeweled by the combined moistures of drizzle and fog, the huddled mourners looked beautiful through the zoom lens. Katie panned the camera across the throng to better admire the perfection of the scene. Long overcoats, sleek shirts, heels stabbing into the grass, banded homburgs, even a scattering of spiderwebbed veils, all spoke of the wealth and power gathered round the open grave, like Hollywood's idea of the perfect somber funeral. The fog swirled, gravestones leaned in the foreground, and the limp branches of a willow provided a sway of green backdrop so that the mourners were like black opals lying against a jeweler's felt. The camera clicked and froze the image forever. Excellent. A fine picture, all would agree, but not good enough for Katie right then. Not when she could sense perfection hovering within reach. She waited for the final detail to slot into place and create the shot, the one guaranteed to accompany that month's feature article. All that stood 
literally between Katie and her big breakthrough, was a thin man in what looked to be an ill-fitting suit. His sloping shoulders narrow, but just wide enough to obscure the star of the show and many others. The recently widowed Felicity Royal, her wide hat haloed the man's head in black, but her face was hidden. Come on, move. She urged him through gritted teeth shifting as the damp grass started to soak through her jeans. Like a suddenly flourished handkerchief, the priest stepped out of the throng and stood looking into the grave to the left of the shot, his bright white robes contrasting perfectly with the gloominess of the falling light. He started to speak. Katie could hear the drone, but not make out the words from her prone position behind a manicured hedge, and the mourners' heads bowed as one. Shit! This is it! Move your ass! She hissed at the thin man. A woman's head dropped onto the shoulder of her companion. Come on, for God's sake. The priest's hands clasped a blood-red Bible to his chest. All she could think was, not quite the one, not quite the one, not quite the one. Never before had she wished anyone dead, truly and sincerely and horribly dead but she wished a whole range of grisly fates on that thin man right then. Each passing second, each click of the camera meant the chance, this glorious, possibly once-in-a-career chance, was slipping away, all thanks to some skinny bastard in an overpriced suit. Katie hissed through her nostrils as the priest's words ended. Several of the throngs shifted slightly, about to lift their heads. She screamed silently behind the shrubbery, wrestling with her fury to keep the camera still. Damn it. Then it happened. The skinny man stepped to his right, just one step, to pat someone on the elbow, and suddenly, the widow herself, Felicity Royal, a mascara streaked crimson lipstick version of the Felicity Royal who had graced televisions the country over for years, glanced up at the overcast heavens. Her ashen face emerging like a beacon from under her hat, whilst those around her still gloomed at the sodden ground. The chief editor beamed and thumped his desk. Now that! He boomed, jabbing a finger at the laptop screen in front of him. It's 15 carats solid golf! Katie smiled the modest smile she had practiced in the mirror a couple of hours ago when the summons to the office of Peep had come through. The fact that the magazine had been in touch mere minutes after she emailed the photo confirmed the feeling that had tingled through her since she had captured the perfect shot at the cemetery. This was it. Peep's chief editor spun the laptop round to her and Katie's modesty crumbled in the glow of her photograph on the screen. A shadowy, somber masterpiece etched out in pin-sharp, high resolution. Oh, not right now, Catherine. The editor almost shouted and Katie flinched, the grin dying on her face. Come on, you bloody paid those people to pose, didn't you? Couldn't be better if you told them where to stand. She breathed in relief and adjusted her skirt over her knees. Just in the right place at the right time, I suppose. The editor sat back pulling the laptop back towards him, eyes on the screen, and laughed. You can make that sound like luck. That's the trick of your job, isn't it? Katie watched his eyes flicker around the image, seeing how they constantly came back to the pale, upward-turned face of Felicity Royal, and knew with a flush of heat that thousands would soon do the same thing when they saw the front cover of Peep on the shelves in a month's time. Bloody hell, the composition is perfect. The editor continued in a more hushed voice, as if seeing the photograph for the first time. The mourners, the trees, the gravestones. He paused for a breath. And her, beautiful and sad and lost, all at the same time. The punters are going to lap it up. Looking at the back of the laptop's lid, Katie remembered the widow in that one moment and the raw, naked pain on Felicity Royal's face that had never been seen on a television screen pain that the public was soon to hungrily drink in. For the first time, she felt the faintest needle prick of guilt. But then the editor lowered the screen, and the talk turned to money and royalties and an extended contract. 
The meeting ended quickly, with promises of being in touch soon and a brisk handshake. Oh, Catherine. The editor stopped her before she closed the door. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as perfection, you know. She frowned in puzzlement. We'll have to airbrush the weirdo out. He spoils the mood a bit. No big deal. Speak to you on Tuesday. Katie, still frowning, clicked the door shut with hot hands and hurried to the lift, already reaching for the tablet in her bag. Weirdo. She shakily opened the photo file and peered at the image she thought she knew so well. What had the editor said? He spoils the mood of it. He. Katie scanned the mourners, seeing them all anew. They were actually people now, not glamorous funeral mannequins. Their faces contorted or slackened or rigid with genuine grief. She picked out the men, all holding onto female hands or arms or shoulders, all except one, a thin man, the one who had moved just in time, stood turned to the side, and he stood alone. His face was lined and angular in profile, his eye hidden in the shadow of a deep socket that made him appear to be in his fifties at least, in a black suit that, now Katie looked more closely, wasn't particularly expensive. His gaunt face bowed to the open grave and hands clasped. He looked every inch the mourner, apart from the fact that he was grinning. The wrought iron cemetery gates loomed grandly against a big sky of cloudless blue, inviting Katie inside onto a path that wound amongst the grass and gravestones. The sun made her squint, but curling leaves pooling in the lengthening shadows of tree trunks signalled the final days of summer, and she zipped up her jacket. In the distance, across the spiky, stony sweep of headstones, a high fence of iron spears and broad trees marked the section of the cemetery that was closed off to the ordinary members of the public. Further along the fence, there was a slight gap where she had squeezed through a few days ago. The private section was where Felicity Royal's husband was buried, where she had taken what promised to be a career-defining photograph, where a thin man had stood amongst a grieving crowd and smiled. The hollow indented eye socket, the laughter lines spiderwebbing from one corner of his eye, the long crease from cheek to clean-shaven chin, the pale, pale lips pursed in amusement, all magnified on Katie's laptop screen, had haunted her ever since. She couldn't get over the wrongness of his expression. Again and again she had peered at the faces of all the mourners, trying to spot one of them sharing the thin man's smile. She unconsciously capitalised him now, trying to see anything that might have sparked his humour. Their expressions varied slightly, but all were contorted in sadness. Perhaps the man was remembering some joke he'd shared with the deceased, or a happy memory. Somehow that didn't explain it. At first, the sneaky nature of the smile had convinced her the thin man was pleased that Mr Royal was dead and she began to contrive all sorts of plots and crimes that he might be guilty of. He was a jealous brother, a scheming business partner, a murderous family physician. She soon dismissed such soap opera thinking, but could not shift the conviction that he was guilty of something other than a severe lack of empathy or tact. A breath of wind edged with autumn ruffled Katie's hair, and she looked up to see that she had reached the end of the public section of the cemetery. The gate at the path's end was only slightly smaller than the main entrance, but padlocked with opening times posted in a glass case and directions pointing to a porter's lodge. Here, the public gravestones were older, their edges rounded with names faded or mossed over. The air was damper and darker here, the sun screened by a thick green canopy of trees overhanging the private fence, but it was quiet and restful. Spurts of unkempt grass wavered in another gust as if waving goodbye to warmer seasons. The graves and verges nearer the main entrance were cleaner and trimmed and ordered, but Katie liked the sense of freedom and privacy here. She supposed that this distant corner would be pretty spooky at night, but in the September sunshine it was... Beautiful. Someone said. Katie yelped and spun around. Isn't it? The thin man asked. 
standing nearby, staring at her. Yes, Katie answered reflexively, taking a small step back, hand fluttering to her chest before she could stop it. Pale lips pursing, the thin man smiled. A smile that she knew so well, and the sight of it so close to her made her feel dizzy and unreal. He turned away and bent over to peer at a crumbling gravestone. There's a bench there. It took Katie a moment to focus on what he had just said. Take a seat, he said, rubbing some moss away from an inscription. His voice was soft and oddly comforting, like a granddad's voice. She looked around, saw the bench behind her and sat down, frowning at the tremble in her thighs. Get a grip of yourself, girl. Bloody hell. Look at the age of him. You could knock him over with one hand. Up close, Katie saw that he was a lot older than she had first thought, perhaps in his eighties, judging by the veins showing through the papery skin on his knuckly hands. They didn't so much as quiver as he cleaned the headstone, however, and he moved with slow certainty, not even bending his knees to reach down. White hair swept back, covered his head, and rested like strands of cotton on his collar. The thin man's suit had once been expensive, she could tell by the cut, but had the stiff shininess of unwashed black worn too often. His trousers ended just above grey socks, adding to the slight air of shabbiness that hung about him. In her photograph, he had looked a lot more smart, a lot sharper. The suit wasn't right on him, she decided. It hung awkwardly about him, creasing and folding in the wrong places. He'd probably had it for years and had shrunk like old men do age withering them into shadowy versions of their former selves. He was certainly thin, the padded suit shoulders drooped significantly, but he didn't seem fragile in the slightest. That's better, he said, flicking away the last bit of moss and standing upright. Katie squinted. He sort of rolled smoothly upright rather than jerkily straightening, as she expected. He saw her watching, and placed a hand on his lower back while stretching extravagantly, his smile crooking into a grimace. Uh, I should take it easy. These old bones crumble at me more and more each day. Bloody charlatan. You're more limber than me, Katie thought, but smiled sympathetically. The thin man gestured to the bench, smiling again. Mind if I take the weight off these achy legs? Trying not to hesitate, Katie slid over and placed her handbag between them. She crossed her legs and pretended not to look as he sighed loudly down onto his seat. Again, despite the outward show of fragility, he seemed to flow into position. The bench didn't even creak as he settled his weight into place and neatly folded his hands in his lap. He too gazed out at the gravestone stretching out before them. As I was saying... It's beautiful, isn't it? Or in that mellow granddad voice of his. It didn't seem reassuring now, though, right by her like someone speaking in an advert or narrating in a film. The thin man didn't speak loudly, but his words rumbled in her teeth and bones, like the bass was turned up too loudly. Also, old and thin as he was, he seemed to fill the space next to Katie, and she had to fight the urge to shift away from him. She nodded neutrally, wondering what about this old guy was raising the hairs on her arms. I love this place at this time of year. He paused and inhaled deeply through his nostrils. A meeting of borders and the edges of things. An arm swept out dramatically. Here we are in a place where the living visit the dead. At a time when things stop growing and get ready to die away. Leaning forward, so that he intruded into Katie's field of vision, he continued. That grave there, for example. She turned her head to see him pointing at the headstone he had been cleaning earlier. Edna Bradbury found out she had cancer when she was 34, knew it was terminal, and made the most of her remaining time. Last six months of her life were the best, they said. To paraphrase the old line, the flame that burns half as long burns twice as bright. As I say, borders and edges. I remember her funeral well. Good turnout. Big blue sky. 
like today. She was well loved. Katie's unease was growing and her scalp started to prickle with sweat. She blurted out, So, do you come here often then? And winced. Nice one, Katie girl. Now you're using one of the oldest chat-up lines in the book on an old man. Go get your walking stick, hot shot you've pulled. The thin man didn't laugh or smile as she expected. Oh, yes. He let the hiss drift out into silence. But then, you know I do. You've seen me here before, haven't you? Caught off guard, she flushed and started to sputter something, anything. He had held up a long-fingered hand to stop her and laughed heartily. <laughs> like a television Santa, she thought wildly. Ho, 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 merry funeral. Don't worry yourself, Katie. I'm not angry. She sat bolt upright at the mention of her name. What is this? Turns out we're a lot alike. Let me explain. How does he know my name? As the thin man reached into a pocket inside his blazer, Katie, thoughts and questions whirling, looked around the cemetery and realized this section was empty. It seemed no one, well, nobody except the weirdo all-stars on this bench, came to this forgotten corner. Feeling confused and foolish and somehow cornered, her eyes traced along the path to the distant far entrance gates, why don't I just get up and walk away, she wondered, and felt her thigh muscles tensing to rise. The magazine the thin man placed across her legs stopped her as surely as if he had just dropped a granite gravestone onto them. On the front, corpse-like and blaring close-up, the anguished face of Felicity Royal tilted upwards as if appealing to the word peep burned blockly across the top in lurid tabloid red. Felicity's slender neck drew the reader's eyes down to the bold white capitals of the headline, Royal Agony. The thin man leaned in close, his scentless breath tickling Katie's cheek. Now that is simply going to leap off the shelves, don't you think? He sat back, and Katie could feel his eyes on her. Good work, Katie. She felt relieved when sudden anger extinguished her fear. She turned on him. What the fuck is this? Are you some kind of sick stalker or something? The thin man merely smiled at her. Do you work for the royals? Some kind of private detective? She waved the magazine in his face and almost shouted. This is next month's edition. It's not even out yet. How did you get this? Maddeningly, the thin man merely straightened his tie and replied calmly. Let's just call it a special edition. Advanced copy. I don't see why you're so upset. It's a splendid piece of work. Why didn't you calm down and turn to page three? What? You listen to me, you... It's a beautiful photograph. He interrupted smoothly. But then you already know that, of course. Go on, enjoy the fruits of your labours. You work at Peep, don't you? Or you know someone there? Someone who got you a copy? Katie tried to hold on to her anger and the strength it had given her, but felt it slipping away, and she didn't resist when the thin man slipped the magazine from her hands. When she looked up, he was holding open a double-page spread. The headline ran, The pain and grief of a star above her photograph, undeniably beautiful, but now awful in that beauty, a very public window into a private moment. Katie imagined people uttering mock sympathy as they bought it along with their cigarettes and chocolate, women chatting about the tragedy as they waited for their hair to dry in salons, social media sites discussing what the widow was wearing and whether her jewellery complemented her dress and shoes. Then someone else would die or become pregnant or get married or divorced or just fall out of a taxi drunk and Felicity Royal's endless pain would be binned and forgotten. Katie felt sick and claustrophobic, and leaned back, trying to see the sky through the maze of branches arching over the bench. Patches and flickers of blue only increased the sense of suffocation, the trees hemming her in with her shame. The thin man stood smoothly, unrolling from the bench, tugging his suit into shape over his frame. He folded Peep and tucked it into his jacket pocket. 
I have been to so, so many funerals in here. And over there, of course. He gestured to the gate leading to the private section. But the memories always fade. He gestured at the grave he had been standing over earlier. Like inscriptions on headstones. Katie tried to think of something to say, to ask how he knew about her, but couldn't. The thin man sniffled the air. Yes, summer fades and autumn waits for its turn. And here we both are. Borders, see? He began to stroll away. Wait, it's not right, Katie shouted as a thought suddenly struck her. She jumped up from the bench as a thin man stopped. The photograph... It's the wrong one. I mean, you're in it. Keith, I mean, the editor. He said you'd be airbrushed out. Yes, and I will be. I don't crave attention. I like to go about my business quietly. You got hold of a copy weeks before publication, with a non-edited picture. What the hell is your business? And that wasn't a rough edition you showed me. That looks like a finished product. The thin man half turned to show her the profile and grin she knew so well. Like I said, special edition. Katie merely stared as he glided away, his suit dark and lopsided against the white gravel of the path, sauntering like a man half his age. Still, she watched as he went through the gates, turned left and disappeared. What the hell? She breathed and slumped back onto the bench. Her brain whirled as she tried to rationalize it all. So who was the thin man then? Convinced he had some connection to Peep, she rose, intending to drive down to the office right then and demand some answers. But the gravestone the thin man had taken such an interest in earlier caught her eye. Edna something, the cancer victim. He said he attended the funeral on a day like today. She hesitated. Go on then, you morbid cow. Go have a look, then get the hell out of this place. Perhaps she was a relation of his, she reasoned, and there'll be some clue to who he is. Just what kind of clue she didn't know, however, and suppose she was just trying to justify her grim nosiness. As she expected, despite the thin man's efforts, the inscription was mostly illegible. The lettering eroded. She looked around and saw that most of the graves were unkempt and unloved here in this older part of the cemetery. She frowned, suspicion darkening her thoughts. Peering close, she made out what must have been part of a name. Adbury. That's right, Edna Bradbury. Weather and moss had claimed most of the other writing, but when she licked her thumb and rubbed at indentations near the bottom, Katie revealed a date chiseled neatly into the granite. September 1st, 1897. Nice blue sky that day was there, Mr. Thin Man. Bullshit. She stood up with satisfaction. I knew you were full of it, bloody old creep. Katie set off down the path with renewed purpose and was actually smiling as she emerged from the tree shade into bright, clear sunshine. Of course, I bet he saw my name as photographer in the magazine. As to how he had known she would be at the cemetery, she still didn't know but supposed vaguely that he would expect her to revisit the scene of the crime as her mind put it without thinking, and returning guilt watered down her satisfaction. How he knew she'd be here today, well, it could have been sheer luck or... To hell with that for now. Just get to the office. She nodded, convinced, and clanged the iron gate shut behind her. That bloody editor or someone has got some talking to do. Despite the pinch of chill in the air, borders see, Katie wound the window down to let some welcome breeze into the car. She hadn't decided what to do once she knew who the thin man was, but for now, knowing would be enough. She took a left off the main road onto a residential street to avoid the lights at the crossroad junction and immediately regretted the decision when the car she had been following suddenly stopped. Bloody idiot! I nearly went into the back of you! She shouted out of the window then immediately pulled her head back in when she saw what the reason was. She barked out a hard laugh. <laughs> what? Unbelievable. A funeral procession of a hearse and dozens of mourners slowly made their way up the street. 
What is it about funerals at the moment? She thought, but didn't speak out loud. For a deep, delicate quiet enveloped the scene, with only the thrumming of the hearse's engine and the occasional scrape of a shoe breaking what would have been utter silence. The lights of the car in front went out, and Katie turned her own engine off as a mark of respect. Local residents peered out of bedroom windows or came to their gates to watch, and Katie remembered herself before an automatic frown of disapproval formed on her face. Your days of being a hypocrite have long gone, I'm afraid. Better get used to a lifetime of not judging. The hearse, long and gleaming, glided past. The driver's face impassive beneath his peaked hat. Katie closed her window as the coffin, polished and new behind flawless glass, drew level with her car. White carnations spelled out, Grandma. Then the mourners drifted by. Obviously a family, with adults and children huddled together, heads bowed. Many others followed a few steps behind, couples linking arms, men with awkward hands clasped behind their backs. The sense of loss ached in the air as the procession snaked towards the cemetery. Katie, not wanting to look but not knowing what else to do, thought about what the thin man had said about funerals being where death and life meet for a while. She glanced up at the cold, clear sky, especially at a time like this, at the edge of another season. The last of the mourners drifted by, but none looked her way. Car engines starting up broke the spell and Katie sat up straight, took in a big breath and turned the key in the ignition. The car in front pulled away and she turned the wheel to follow, glancing in the rearview mirror as she set off. What? The lopsided suit, creased in the wrong places, the white hair combed back. Him? She almost stalled, the car juddering recovered and looked again. At the back of the procession, appearing for all of the world like he belonged there, the thin man sauntered after the hearse. He didn't look her way. Bastard! She almost screamed, overcome with the fury she couldn't fully explain. His words came back to her. I have been to so, so many funerals. But how did he get here that fast? He did leave before me. Must have known about the funeral. Driven here, then slipped into the procession. She remembered a small girl in a dark grey dress, a grandchild probably, sucking her thumb, bewildered, carried by a weeping woman. She banged the steering wheel. Sick bastard! You and me, we are nothing alike, you parasite! All Katie could think about was getting to Peep's office and finding out just who the thin man was once and for all. She sped away and quickly caught the car in front, how about I photograph you again, thin man? Expose you in your own center page spread. Wipe that bloody smile off your face. Teeth gritted, she eased off the accelerator, cursing the slowness of the traffic. In the near distance, a traffic light showed amber, and she urged the car in front to get through before it changed to red. She realized that in her anger, she had blindly turned back onto the main road and was at the crossroads junction she had wanted to avoid in the first place. Damn it! This is the day from hell. Just let me get to that office. With maddening inevitability, the traffic light flipped to red just after the car in front squeezed through. Katie slowed, then cursed loudly and planted her foot on the accelerator. She just had enough time to register the protesting growl of her engine and the blaring of a horn before a bus loomed like a titan and smashed into her. <laughs> the world boomed jerked madly, then whirled as Katie's car crumpled in the bus's jaws, scraped sideways, then flipped onto its roof. In seconds, the scream of the bus's brakes and the squealing grind of metal on tarmac tightened into a single thin high note of pain. Katie moaned as the upside-down world grayed around her before the sharp, coppery stink of blood snapped her back. The seatbelt felt like a band of fire across her chest, and she panicked when she could only manage to inhale a faint whistle of breath. Dimly, she realized the pain needling through her body stopped at her waist. She bent her head up, trying to look at her legs, but they were lost in a tangle of metal, and her neck exploded in agony. Her arms, sleeved in blood, dangled down against the roof and she started to cry when she couldn't make the move. She started to grey out again. Hey, Katie. Katie. 
The sound of her name was like a lifeline reaching out to her through the gathering darkness, and blarily she caught onto it, trying to hold on. Come on, Katie. Open your eyes. Her eyelids, feeling raw and fleshy and so, so heavy, slowly lifted open and she squinted. Open your eyes. The voice came from the passenger's window where a figure kneeled silhouetted against the sharp glitter of daylight. The brightness hurt her eyes, but Katie strained to see, clinging to the voice. Come on, Katie. He knows my name, she thought dreamily. She blinked, willing herself to focus. Details started to sharpen out of the blur of light, her reeling brain trying to reassemble the upside-down elements into an image. White hair, a lopsided dark suit. A smile she knew so well. No, 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 please, no. She tried to turn away, but metal bit into bone and skin, and she nearly passed out again. Don't you worry, Katie, he said as she began to sob. I will be there. Everybody Loves a Parade Written by Charlie Davenport Performed by Jason Hill Peter lay still in the early morning hours, feeling the press of the coming 365 days and the chill of winter nipping around the edges of his covers. He remembered the advice one of Shelby's friends had given him when he first arrived in California. Two years, a gregarious fellow named Gabriel had said, as they sat on lawn chairs sipping away on Takati and other beers Peter had never encountered before. Streamers hung overhead, and a decimated piñata dangled from the basketball hoop, battered from the assaults by Gabriel's children. Stretched out above it all was a store-bought banner that proclaimed, Welcome back, Shell. Handwritten in black marker was the tag. And welcome, Pete. Peter felt that it was a nice addition. Yeah, two years for what? he asked. To simulate, Gabriel said, though in his current state, speaking through equal parts tequila and negro madeo, the word snuck past his lips, sounding more like simulate. You know, to feel like uh, SoCal is, uh, you know, home. (laughs) Peter still hadn't fallen into the rhythms of the place. He felt a little odd wearing shorts in October, and his New England accent still proved to be a source of amusement for far too many people. The cashier at the supermarket up the street had actually asked him to repeat words in his native dialect, Ka and Yad, before she would hand him his change. Peter suspected he would never quite simulate, but there was nowhere else he'd consider home. Where Shelby was, wherever that might be, would always be where he belonged. Their first date back in D.C. had lasted eight hours, covering everything from her childhood in Northern California to her research at the university, and, most importantly, her very definite plans for what to do in case of a zombie apocalypse. In the weeks that followed that first date, Peter discovered that life was divided neatly into two periods of time. The time with Shelby, and the time away from her. Within a month they were living together, and, when she announced a job opportunity had come up in California, Peter didn't debate relocating for even a moment. Less than a week later, he'd successfully gotten his request for a transfer to the California branch of Bellator Corp., Approved the speed unheard of in the firm's history. Now, sitting in bed, Peter looked out their window on Wrigley Lane. Ordinarily, the sky above his home was a uniform, featureless, pale blue. 
but after half a decade of drought, El Nino had come back and brought the first honest rain that Peter had known in this place. For a week, there were actual clouds above. They had been dark and full, too. Today, however, they held back at a respectable distance above the town. It was, after all, parade day. Peter watched Henry, their son, lying still on the tiny screen of his baby monitor. In the distance, he could barely hear the preparations for the festivities. Nothing definite, just the wind carrying the occasional bang of a drum or snippet of a voice broadcast over loudspeakers. He picked up the TV remote. The NBC affiliate was covering the parade. The perennial hosts sat in a booth above the route. Their practiced smiles plastered tightly to their faces. Peter watched as the first float came into the camera's view. Posies, river reeds, and other arranged vegetation illustrated a collection of fanciful scenes that flowed from jungle to peaked castle. The float's riders moved from scene to scene by way of slides placed between them. They cavorted with all manner of bizarre, multi-limbed creatures as fanciful aircraft and spaceships bounced overhead. The tradition of the parade had begun years ago, when people like him, transplants from the frigid east, decided to celebrate the warm paradise they now inhabited. It had been held every New Year's Day since 1890, save for those that fell on a Sunday. Locals said that the founders had made a nodding agreement with the Almighty when the floats rolled out on that first day. They vowed to never hold it on a Sunday, and, for his part, God would never let it rain on the procession. Looking at the horizon and the line of rolling black clouds held at bay, Peter could almost believe it. He heard the bedroom door open and his wife appeared a moment later. How's Henry? She inquired. Peter held the baby monitor in his hand up to her, and, as if on cue, their son let out a comically loud snore. Shelby's face broke into a grin above her puffy eyes. He's so cute, she said adoringly. Did you make tea? Not yet, Peter replied. Shelby gave him a jokingly disapproving look. You know the rules, Mr. Sandow. You wake up first, you make the tea. At least, get the water started. And I'm sorry, Dr. Sandow, I don't know what I could have been thinking. (laughs) Useless. She smiled and shuffled towards the kitchen to fulfill the task in question. Happy New Year, Peter called after her. Her head and shoulders appeared at the door. (laughs) Shh. She pressed her index finger to her lips and then withdrew her hand to point at Henry's door. Happy New Year, honey. She replied with a smile. A small wail came from both the screen and Henry's room, announcing that their little boy was ready to join the rest of the world. I got him, Peter said as he got up from the couch. Yeah, you do. Shelby called from the kitchen, silence no longer a concern. They got Henry changed, fed, and dressed. His tendency to sling formula around made it madness to try it in any other order. Shelby made waffles while Peter prepared mimosas for them to sip and marinated steaks that would later be placed on the grill. Periodically, they would check in on the parade's progress, marching bands and well-groomed horses weaving their way down Colorado Boulevard between the floats. They had yet to go see the parade in person, at least not the one during the day. Anybody wanting a reasonably good live view either had to be part of the media coverage or sleep out on the sidewalk the night before. After the parade was over, though, the floats would park at a local high school parking lot. Folks would be charged admission for the chance to walk around and view all the care and craft that went into putting these wonders together. Peter and Shelby had discussed taking Henry to see them when he was old enough to remember it, but that was still years away. After everyone got an eyeful of the blossom-strewn works of art, they'd be gathered up into a convoy. The greenery would be tied down with a skeleton crew doing various tasks to keep the floats together as they drove several miles to the stadium. There, they'd be taken apart, stripped of their finery, and rendered nothing more than bare wire frames. 
It was what Shelby called the nighttime show. The year they'd first arrived on Wrigley, they celebrated the new year much as they did this year. They cooked and watched the parade, doing a fair bit of day drinking while they observed. The days of carousing and imbibing like it was an occupation had passed them by. Peter suspected, now that Harry was with them, that there was a very good chance they'd soon stop staying up until midnight as well. The prior evening's festivities consisted of him watching a rerun of Family Guy while Shelby slept on the couch beside him. When he roused her to tell her it was midnight and marked the moment with a kiss, she muttered something and trundled off to bed without another clear word passing her lips. The year before had been so different. That evening a year ago, Shelby had stuck her head up against their great bay window and slightly wide-eyed gestured for Peter to follow her outside. Most of the neighbors were already gathered outside, watching the floats pass by, slowly chugging along down the main road toward the stadium. Standing there, the two of them watched the gray shapes approach, their remaining glory revealed in the wavering pools cast by the streetlights overhead. It was a stripped-down, spontaneous encore of a performance, a great, secret show that only the locals knew about. Standing there in the chill of that evening, Peter occasionally looked at his neighbors, people that strangely did not generally interact with one another. But that night, each time he caught someone's eye, the two would smile at each other and nod in a companionable way. No one spoke, no one hollered. There was a kind of reverence to this. Dozens of floats passed by. Occasionally, the riders, those maintaining these temporary vehicles for the last few miles, would look up from their labors and wave. The group watched until the last in a convoy, a bizarre little scene depicting various prehistoric creatures crawling out of the La Brea pits, faded into the darkness. Shelby stood in front of him, allowing Peter to wrap his arms around her. Together, they silently bid goodnight to their neighbors as all retreated into their homes. That night, as they settled into bed, Peter felt sleepy, heavy in that delightful way sometimes felt before a wonderful night's rest. The day had been peaceful, the night almost magical. He slid over to his wife and buried his head in her hair breathing deeply as he drifted off into sleep. After a time, he found himself, without explanation, no longer in his bedroom, or the formless nothing of sleep, but instead at the corner of Colorado Boulevard. Above him, the sky was clear and cloudless. He soon became aware that he was not alone on the street. Cardboard people of every age and hue had formed rough lines on both sides of the boulevard. They all wore the same vacant, rigid smile secured to their faces, and Peter could smell that they reeked of rotting flowers. As one, they turned their heads, their eyes wide with some indiscernible emotion. For a terrible moment, Peter was certain that they were staring at him. But following their gaze, his eyes fell on something on the distant horizon. A speck along the curve of the earth, tiny as a drop of blood trickling its way down a pricked finger. He stood with the gathered crowd, unable to look away from that far-off thing. Soon, he could feel its approach reverberating in his chest. He began to make the object out, identifying distinct individuals that comprised a column of people. He watched as each one, in perfect time with one another, would raise one leg and bring it down with a brutal crack against the asphalt, only to repeat the motion with the other leg a moment later. With each strike, Peter could make out more details. They wore uniforms, drab gray with brass ornaments flashing from the chest and shoulders. They made Peter think of military cadets. 
or a marching band. He soon saw that all of the figures carried an instrument of some kind, either in front of them or hoisted on their shoulders. Then he could hear the music they made. Or at least it was something like music. Cymbals crashed and drums banged out at odd arrhythmic intervals. Horns of every description blared shrill notes in horrendous counterpoint to the synchronicity of the band's marching feet. Every few feet one of the marchers would tear free from the crowd and post along the route, blocking the mass of humanity that had gathered to watch from coming any closer. Each onlooker wore the same static idiot leer as those standing around Peter, but all of their eyes burned with an unnatural intensity that spoke only of simple hatred. After hundreds, maybe even thousands of them passed by Peter, he saw a single float making progress down the street. A simple flat bed with wire frames rising from it covered only in patches of wilted or rotting flowers. A small collection of people milled around those patches. Some were elderly, others looked to be in the prime of their lives. Some held children in their arms. No one looked particularly happy or sad. Their eyes simply moved languidly from one side of the route to the next, showing no particular interest. They did not speak to each other. They didn't even seem aware of each other. Well, except for the two that rode at the front of the float. One was a young woman dressed as though she'd just come from the gym, likely a senior in high school or a college freshman. There was something wrong with her, though. Her posture looked stooped, broken somehow. Her face was strained with the tremendous effort it must have taken for her to simply stand. Each jostle of the decaying platform brought a fresh expression of agony to her young face. Her hand rested on the shoulder of an elderly man seated in an old wooden chair. The touch seemed as much out of a need for support as any sign of affection it might have meant. The elderly gentleman vacantly scanned the crowd as he waved to them but received no recognition except their ever-present toothy grins. From the man's position, Peter immediately guessed him to be the Grand Marshal of this procession. Periodically, the elderly man's eyes would roll to the back of his head. He wore an ornate crown that pulled with such a weight on him that his neck lulled to the side. Peter wasn't entirely sure, but... It almost looked like it was made of thorns. The young woman tapped the marshal on his shoulder and pointed downward as they passed Peter. He watched the old man allow gravity to snap his head toward him. And, over the cacophony, Peter heard a voice as old as time say one word. Hello. And then he was awake. Peter sputtered around for a few moments as the dream slowly bled away from him. He calmed down and began taking in the world around him. In his own bedroom, he became aware of the complete, blurred stillness of his surroundings. There was a small, hitching noise that he couldn't first identify, as if it was coming to him through cotton. His surroundings refused to come into clear view. As he began blinking his eyes furiously, he found that they were filled with salty tears. Had he woken up crying? Shelby bolted up and over his stuttering breath asked Peter what was wrong. He had no words to describe it, except that he'd had a nightmare. She cradled him and slowly ran her fingers over his brow until he drifted back to sleep. When he awoke again, he'd largely forgotten about the disturbing interlude. There were bills to pay, birthdays to remember. Days turned into months, and in February of that year, Shelby announced that their family was to grow by one. 
With the press of everyday life and impending fatherhood, there was no time to dwell on a single night of poor rest. That is, until one night, while watching the news, Peter rubbing Shelby's shoulders, they came across the story of Cynthia Ann Ryder. The story itself was not remarkable. Most people will hear a version of it at least once a year or more. A local teenager on her way back from a party tries to run the spotlight, just enough alcohol buzzing through her system to never see the truck that had the green. According to the report, she told her parents she was meeting up with some friends after soccer practice. Miss Ryder's body was thrown from the vehicle. She expired at the scene. Both Shelby and Peter remarked on the event with the off-handed and directionless sympathy most have upon hearing such a story. The next day, however, while sitting at his desk, Peter thought about the girl and felt a need, a sharp and suddenly pressing need, to put a face to the name Cynthia Ann Ryder. Peter searched for her name and came across a few LinkedIn and Facebook profile results people looking for new employment opportunities, and one young lady in Ohio that had won a county spelling bee the previous April. After a bit of sifting, he came across the Cynthia Ann he was looking for on one of the local news station's websites. He scanned the details about her from the article. Good student, taught soccer at a summer camp for underprivileged youth, a wonderful big sister to her nine-year-old brother. None of these or any of the other assorted details about her life set off any bells for Peter. But when he saw her photo, a tickle pressed at the back of his mind, something oddly familiar about the slope of her nose, the shape of her eyes. Where do I know her from? Peter wondered about the girl for the rest of the day. At meetings and in casual conversation, it gnawed at his every moment until he laid his head down that night. When his head touched the pillow, he smelled Shelby's shampoo and, for the first time since that day so early in the year, he remembered the parade. He put Cynthia's face to the shattered form of the girl riding the float in that nightmare landscape, and he recalled the old man, the Grand Marshal. He wanted to jolt upright, to do something about the whole ordeal. What was that going to be? He had no idea. But it was already too late. He felt himself slipping into sleep as though he were sliding irreversibly down a long tunnel. When he emerged on the other side, he was along the parade route again, and the float was drawing close. There was no sign of the young woman in her gym gear who would never see her first semester of college. Cynthia Ann Ryder had shuffled off this life. The parade had moved her along. Peter saw the others still riding with the marshal, their eyes drowsily scraping the crowd as they passed. There was someone else standing by the marshal now, a dark-skinned man with a severe militaristic manner. His face was smoothly shaven and placid, his eyes full of shrewd wariness, looking out at the crowd with the same intensity he'd leveled during staff meetings back in D.C. Peter could place that detail because, unlike Cynthia Ryder many nights before, he recognized this man. He had worked with him for the better part of five years, and while they hadn't been friends, they'd certainly liked each other enough to engage in polite conversation. Peter would ask about the man's family, and Clarence Wise would ask how Pete's gal was getting along. He looked just as Peter remembered him. That is until he turned his head. That simple motion gave Peter full view of his former co-worker's face and the ghastly wounds that had destroyed most of it. The lower part of Wise's jaw had been pulped by some terrific force. Whatever it was had traveled up past his left eye and exploded at the top of his head, turning his cranium into some kind of gory, improvised funnel. This grotesque parody of his old friend stared at Peter, 
recognition lighting in his sole remaining eye. Peter saw Wise's mouth attempt to form some kind of word as he bent toward the marshal's ear. Hello, said the Grand Marshal. Somewhere within the infinite weariness of that voice, there was also a hint of familiarity. Peter was an old friend come to visit, someone that the marshal expected to see again. Upon waking and taking the time to gather himself, Peter started making calls back to every number he still had in his phone from the D.C. office. But, it being a Saturday, there was no answers until he tried Kenny Bryden's number. Hello, Bellato Corp. This is Kenny Bryden. How may I help you? Kenny's Jersey accent clanged across the line. Hey, Kenny, it's uh, Peter Sandow. It had been two years, and though he'd been in the cubicle opposite Kenny for a long time, he had no expectations of being remembered. Petey! The boisterous voice proclaimed. Despite his 57 years, Kenny was full of bounding, aggressive optimism that could be both just what you needed to hear in the middle of the week and the most grating thing on a Monday morning. Is it you blowing up every phone in the office? <laughs> you forget what day it is? <laughs> uh, 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 no, uh, I, was, I was hoping to catch anyone, really. I'm trying to get a hold of Clarence Wise. Had a question I, I thought he could answer. Kenny sighed deeply. It's, um, it's not likely. Peter felt cold. Rumor is, yesterday, Clarence got up early and made breakfast for his kids. He told his wife he was headed out to the garage for get something out of his car, or something like that. After an hour or so, she went looking for him. He could already picture Clarence walking down the perfectly shoveled path from his house. His head hung low, moving with the same purposeful stride he always had. She found him in the note he'd written, apologizing for the... Apologizing for the mess. Kenny shuffled the papers on his desk loudly enough for Peter to hear them in California. Well, did it say why? Peter did not want to ask how. He was certain he already knew. Don't know, but I doubt it. He wasn't the type to complain. An edge of admiration was present in Kenny's voice. Peter struggled through a few more minutes of question and answer with Kenny, but in the end none of it lodged too deeply in his memory. Clarence Wise was dead, by his own hand, and he had known in advance. It would follow that pattern again and again. A relative he hadn't seen in years had died of a heart attack while jogging, a drunk had killed a neighbor's child because they just refused to take a cab home. On the evening news, a family of four died in an avalanche in Colorado. Peter saw every last one in turn take his or her place alongside the Grand Marshal. There was never enough time to do anything about it, though. No appointed time was ever given. No address. No set of instructions that led him to being at the right place at the right time. He was simply the nightly witness to the parade and its passengers. There were times in the early morning hours, tears burning his eyes for the umpteenth time, that he considered joining Clarence. But there were still bills to pay. He had a job with the increasing responsibilities that came with climbing the corporate ladder, and he was trying to balance all of it with a new child in the house, trying to find any gaps in the baby-proofing measures he and Shelby had taken. So his nights, filled with unease and terror, slowly became just another fact of his life. Somehow he managed the day-to-day -day miracle of not simply cracking from the strain... At the start of October, his branch manager, Mr. Rivers, called him to the fourth floor, home to senior management, to discuss a project that he'd been working on for the company. 
The lower floors were all open concept space, cubicles with dividers so low that you could see all your co-workers at once. Facilitating collaboration, said the administration. When the elevator door slid open, Peter noted that the managers had more traditional offices, granting them such luxuries as walls and doors. Peter knocked upon arriving at River's door. Mr. Rivers invited him in as he sat comfortable behind his overly large and imposing desk. He was a neatly attired man of some indeterminate middle age, wearing a double-breasted suit that was a few years out of style. His double chin and earnest attempt at a comb-over did not detract from his air of authority. Another man with a full head of stark white hair sat in front of Rivers but made no move to turn around as Peter approached. Ah, Peter. Please have a seat. Rivers rose slightly and gestured at the chair next to the white-haired man. Do you know Tom Bedford? Peter had heard the name and had seen pictures on the company's website. Mr. Bedford, the director of West Coast Development. Mr. Bedford presenting to the shareholders. Mr. Bedford meeting with regulatory officials in D.C., Mr. Bedford biking down the 101 on a charity ride he organized every year. Sponsored by Bellator, of course. I don't believe we've met before. The man in his casual polo shirt exuded a virility that Peter never believed he could achieve in his own lifetime. Bedford stood and, smiling, offered Peter his hand. Hello, Tom Bedford. And I've been hearing some great things. The rest of his greeting was difficult to hear as the blood pounded in Peter's ears. Hello. 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 The word he'd said to Peter almost every night that year. Every night as he wore that awful crown on his head. His grimacing face turned towards the sky. His eyes flashing white as if in mid-seizure. Hello. Standing before Peter in Mr. Rivers' office was Tom Bedford, head of West Coast Development for Bellator Corp. Standing before Peter in Mr. Rivers' office was the Grand Marshal of the Parade. The meeting carried on for a while. Peter responded to their questions, offered projections for completion. At the end of their time, seeming pleased with the results... Bedford excused himself as he had to run to another appointment. He thanked Peter for his time. As an afterthought, he told Peter that he was certain they'd meet again. Peter successfully fought back the urge to shriek in the man's face. It was Friday, after all, and near enough five o'clock to go home. He stayed up late that night, desperate to avoid sleep. But after a number of beers meant to fight the rising panic, his eyelids announced their resignation to their fate and slid over his eyes as he sat on the couch. He was once again on the corner of Colorado Boulevard on a clear and cloudless day. The crowd gathered, the band struck up the music, and the parade's column moved down its appointed path. At last the float, the one he'd seen so many times, drew near, and Peter saw that Tom Bedford alone rode atop it. Without the weight of the others to balance it, the float bucked and rattled like a rickshaw, only emphasizing the horrible gesticulations of Bedford's form. It groaned to a halt in front of Peter. The music stopped. The marchers were gone. The murmur of the crowd had ceased. Peter looked around him and was alone with the marshal and the route. Peter, in absolute certainty, had only one thought. It's me now. It's my turn. He thought about Shelby finding his corpse on the couch in the morning. He thought about her raising Henry alone. He wept. And he kept weeping until he heard the marshal's voice croak out a single word. Goodbye. 
and with that Peter was awake on his couch, feeling the edge of a nasty hangover approaching. Upon opening his work computer the following Monday, he saw a new email in his inbox with the subject line, A Loss in the Bellator Family. It is with sadness that we must inform you that last Sunday Tom Bedford suffered a dreadful crash on his bicycle. Though all efforts were made, his injuries were too severe for him to recover. The rumor around the office was that it had first seemed an insignificant accident. Another rider had drifted too close to Bedford, and his in attempts to avoid the crash, he had fallen headfirst off the trail into some brambles. The jovial man had laughed off the scratches from the thorns, simply taking some aspirin to combat the ache in his head. After arriving home, he'd drawn up a chair at his kitchen table and told his wife that whatever she was cooking for dinner smelled great. Mrs. Bedford was confused, as it was ten o'clock and nothing was in the oven. A moment later, Tom Bedford, a man in phenomenal shape for his mid-fifties, fell off the chair and began writhing on his kitchen floor. In the weeks and months that followed, Peter did not dream, not of the parade, not of anything at all. He was grateful for the simplicity of shutting his eyes and finding nothing waiting to greet him. The whole thing receded and seemed more of a fevered notion he once had than a memory of real events. Halloween came and went, Thanksgiving followed, then Christmas, and before he knew it New Year's Day was almost upon them. Now, as they sat and watched and clapped along with Henry at everything that tickled his fancy, Peter felt happier than he had in a long time. They watched everything together, from the riders on their majestic horses to the marching bands to the floats themselves. At one point, Shelby leaned over to her husband when Henry seemed so excited that he might burst at any minute. She whispered that she couldn't wait to see what Henry thought of the nighttime show. As the evening came, they gathered with their neighbors as they had the year before, and watched as the wondrous fabrications were transported past their street and out into the night. Peter stood next to Shelby with Henry in his arms, listening to every delighted, Ooh, that came out of his son. And, for the first time since his last dream wondered if he might see the parade one more time that night. That night, with Henry tucked safely in his crib, Peter lay next to Shelby with his eyes fixed on the darkened ceiling above him. Again, he did not want to sleep, fearing that this period had been a lull, the eye of some storm that had been waiting to toss him back into the water again. He fretted and turned for hours as Shelby snored heavily next to him. But in the early hours of that January morning, his head heavy with fog and half-formed plans, he eventually drifted off. The crowd welcomed him back as one of their own, and the band nodded their recognition as they passed. Peter stood impassively, letting the event wash over him as the float rattled into view. On it, he saw the fresh gaggle of the young and old, the healthy and the sick, the deserving and the tragic. One by one they would announce themselves to him and then go on their final way, for some reason, for no reason. Peter supposed it didn't matter. With a muted interest, he saw that someone new, a woman, sat in the chair at the front of the float. It made sense, of course. Bedford was gone. He had given up his place of honor and joined the rest in whatever place they went to over the horizon when their time had come. Peter leaned forward and could see that the once beautiful woman's sun-kissed skin and brown eyes were now ravaged by disease, a condition of which she was not yet even aware. She probably wouldn't know for another year about that thing slowly turning her into a poor imitation of the vibrant being she'd once been. 
In the waking world, his fists balled up by his sides and he began driving them into the mattress repeatedly. A tiny voice that was more like his son's than his own, wailing, No! No! Peter knew her long before she passed by him. He remembered meeting her on a random event 2,000 miles away from where they lived now. He knew her long before she waved. He could almost smell the hospital room where they'd held their son together for the first time. He knew her long before she said, Hello. As he watched Shelby pull away from him for the first time that year, Peter knew what Mrs. Bedford must have felt after the paramedics came for her husband. He knew what Clarence Wise's wife had felt when she saw what depression had done to her one and only. He knew what Cynthia Ryder's family had felt the morning after the accident. He knew what Henry would feel as he grew and the slivered memories of his mother would slip away from him. Peter felt alone in the parade carried on into the night. Real Hunger Can't Be Fed Written by H.K. Rays Narrated by Andrea Rose Time to go soon, but before I do, I want to tell you all about my cowboy, the man who took me into the forever night, the man who made me hungry and then left me to starve. Listen close, I want to tell you about the man I love. I grew up a preacher's daughter. Daddy thundered fire and brimstone from the pulpit on Sunday. Repent or be damned, and hillbillies would shout and quiver. At night, he pulled out my jammies and sweat over me, whispering the word of God in my ear. He'd take the belt to me after. <sighs> Temptation is a sin, child. Only like yours will lead the righteous astray. Mama was soft and kind, with slate gray eyes and a voice like a sparrow song. Her makeup was caked thick to hide the purple on her cheekbones. Let's run away, I said. Run as far as we can and be free. She pet my head and dried my tears and told me, Ain't nowhere to run, baby. It's the same all over. This is the way life is. Be a good girl, and we'll find our reward in the other place. I didn't like it when Daddy spat hellfire, but I liked to hear Mama talk about the other place. In my dreams, it was orange and pink. The desert sunrise surging like wildfire beyond the mountains. In my dreams, I felt the sky and the folds of my heart. And I was free. I ran one night past brush and prairie dog holes with Daddy's voice on the chase. You get back here, devil girl. Or I'll whip you silly. But I was fast and small and hard to find in the dark. I crouched low behind an old mesquite. <laughs> Teardrops making polka dots in the silver sand. I clasped my hand and whispered a prayer. Please, if you're out there, help me. Show me a way out. I heard something. The sound of a hunter picking meat off his kill. Wet chewing and slurping and something scraping the ground. I followed the sound and found a circle of rocks like a heathen church. Something in the middle bobbing up and down. Something else twitching and moaning. I hugged close to a big rock. 
and peeked my head around the side. I saw a man, a skinny cowboy in faded denim and snakeskin boots. His skin was so pale it looked like blue jelly. He crouched and licked at the neck of another shaking on the ground. The other's eyes were wide and rolling, his quivering fish mouth sucking the air. Cowboy's head shot up, and he sniffed. Streaks of red oozed down his mouth, so there was molasses. His head jerked around, and his eyes found mine. Black eyes, ultra eyes, eyes that held the night itself. Eyes that could wrap you up and squeeze you soft or tight. He smirked, and stringy pieces of red shook as he talked. Ain't your mom ever teach you not to stare? I know what you are. Bloodsucker, right? I seen the movies. Get your head out of the clouds, girl. Me and my buddy are just having a talk. Make me like you. I said, cowboy laughed. <laughs> you want to be like me. Sucking on dead meat in the dark like a mangy old dog. I am a dog, a dog with its leg in a trap. And I want you to chew it off. My mama says this is just how it is, but I'm going to run and run and look for somewhere that's different. Your mama's a smart woman. You want to kill. Ain't no one want to be like me unless they got someone to kill. My daddy? Hmm. It's always the daddies. Listen up, girl. This life ain't no fairy tale. It's a death rattle before every meal. It's railroad spike hunger. So sharp you can't think of nothing else. It's a forever night with no more sunrises. No more to the last one. The one that'll light you up like the 4th of July. I told you I've seen the movies. Then you've seen the endings. It's a bad luck life and you'd be stupid to pick it. I stepped out from behind the rock and stared hard into those marble eyes. I pulled my dress up over my head and dropped it into the sand. Naked and shaken, I walked toward him. I brushed my hair from my neck and said, I might be stupid, but I know what I want. Sink your teeth into me, cowboy. Find the red life inside me and make it your own. He stood up and circled me, his frozen eyes chilling me wherever they looked. <sighs> Dummy. He said at last. You want to run from the sun. I won't tell you no. <sighs> Get ready. It hurts. He pulled me close and snuffed at my neck. Cold nose and cold breath. My heart pumping like it was out of time. His mouth opened and he breathed white froth. Lockjaw bite sunk into my flesh. And reason why I scraped my veins. My skin screamed and my insides swelled thick with tar. I dropped down into the dirt. It takes a minute to get used to it. He said. No, go. Sorry, honey. 
I ramble solo. Eat soon. Or it'll make you crazy. Adios. He was gone. The world was gone. I was falling or floating in cavernous dark, nothing above or below. Heavy footsteps pulled me back from eternity. I opened my mouth and gurgled. Oh, come back to me. No more. Come back. Daddy looked down at me and cracked his swollen look. I think it's high time I taught you something about humility. He said. Iron hands dragged me back to the yard and lifted me onto a splintery workbench. I'm a patient man, child. But we can't have you running off like that no more. He lifted a crowbar and set it down gently to kiss my kneecap. His eyes were ablaze with white fire. The word of the Lord shall light the holy path, he said. Raising the crowbar high. And the wicked shall cower under the sword of judgment. <laughs> A cackle from the shadows. A preacher man, huh? I never had much use for the word. Daddy spun round. Who in the hell's that? I'm the sin you ain't got the balls to commit. Cowboy stepped forward, the moon making a halo around his oil spill hair. Let her alone, he said. Daddy laughed. <laughs> Who's gonna make me? Skinny boy like you? Come here, son, and I'll put the fear of God into you. Daddy swung the crowbar, <laughs> and Cowboy caught it. <laughs> Daddy's arm snapped, and slick white bone popped through the skin. He fell, screaming. Cowboy drove the crowbar deep into his gut. A fence post pinning him to the ground. Skinny boys are hard to kill, old man. And I'm as skinny as they come. Go ahead, girl. You must be feeling it by now. I was. My belly hissed and clawed like a raccoon in a cage. I rolled off the table and crawled on all fours, daddy squealing and shouting, but the sound was distant and small. I heard one thing and one thing only. The warm heartbeat calling me with its low rhythm. I clamped my teeth hard into his neck. Sweet juice spurted and dribbled down my chin like a rat tangerine. It pumped into my mouth and filled me until I shuddered inside. Daddy was maggot white and stammering. Please. <coughs> I ran sticky red hands through his hair. <coughs> Danny, it's okay. I'm gonna teach you something about humility, I said. I stuck my fingers into the hole in his neck and pulled until the meat split apart. His scream went high like a cicada whine. Bones snap at a candied rhythm, flesh and fat squishing in my hands. The final skin ribbon snapped in his neck. Just like that, he was left of us. I threw his head into the brush and sucked his jugular dry like a milkshake straw. I looked up. With my belly filled with the soul of another, I could see colors I didn't have names for. I heard crickets landing on blades of grass and smelled the powder on wings of moths. I felt the neon nerd for the first time. And I hello to my cowboy. 
A blue denim dream with see-through skin. I looked at him, and I knew I'd follow him to the end. You ain't never forget your first, he said. I showed him a red smile that dropped when I heard the screams. Mama was in the yard yelling, Charles! Charles! And staring at Daddy's big blue hands. She looked at me. Monster! She yelled through choking sobs. No, Mama, wait! But Cowboy's hand held my shoulder. She's right. He said. You ain't got no mama now. I kind don't make friends with the food. Run, girl. And find the place you're looking for. I'm coming with you. The hell you are. I got enough shit to shovel without babysitting, too. I didn't ask no questions. The world was small before I met you. Now it's big enough to swallow me up. And I want to see it all. Well, you ramble, I ramble as long as it takes. <sighs> God damn, girl. You're like a toothache that won't go away. <sighs> well, if you're coming, then come. Sun's hot on our heels, and... If we don't keep moving, he's going to catch us in the open. I stuck close to his side, and we ran. When the sun went down, we'd stalk the hill, hunting for bony ranch hands and oily teenagers. My ears were sharper than his, and I could hear the river rush in their veins in my love. I'd wrap myself in a velvet shadow and wait for my meal to walk by. He taught me how to hit them with a kill strike to make it quick. How to crush their windpipe so they wouldn't scream. How to make it look like a cougar attack. Every meal was a sticky poem. Sweet as strawberry jam when I licked between my fingers. During the day we'd lay low in a cave or an old trailer. And he'd tell me stories as I floated into dreams. He called me his toothache. He didn't talk much about his life before the bite. There had been a wife and a daughter, but they were long gone. I asked what happened to them once, and his dark eyes looked away. You never forget your first. He said. And I didn't ask again. One night, we found a couple hikers wrapped up in their sleeping bags. Liz didn't even wake up, but mine was feisty. He was fighting and flailing and flopping slowly as I sucked out the juice. Finally, she just held my back and breathed slow. I looked in her half-closed eyes. She knew it was all right, and the end wasn't really so scary. I kissed her soft. And left a red stain on her lip. Shh. Just relax on. Relax and let go. You're going to the other place. I said. Her eyes went cloudy and she drifted away. Cowboy scoffed. <laughs> other place. Grow up, Toothache. Ain't no place but here. You're a grumpy old dog sometimes. How do you know what comes after? I've been on the hunt long enough to know that the only difference between live meat and dead meat is a few twitches and grunts. Think what you want. I've seen the other place in my dreams and we're going there when it's over. He laughed. <laughs> Sunday school was a long time ago, kid. If there is another place, you and I ain't gonna see it. 
We're burning for what we've done. Eating ain't a sin. We're gonna be free and happy, and you'll thank me when we get there. Kid. He said with narrow eyes. If you can point to one thing, one real goddamn thing that'll show me there's something else in the sky, I will drop to my knees and sing hallelujah right here. I was quiet for a bit. I prayed that night, I said. I prayed for a way out, and there you were. Make fun all you want, but I see the other place when I look at you. Maybe I ain't got proof, but I got hope. I hope there's orange and gold at the end of this night. A place where all hearts are soothed, and bright light fills us until we are the sun. And I hope we go there together, you and me, together with no end. Why in the hell do you want that? Because I... Because I... And I was going to say the word, but he gave me a look that's taught me cold. I held the word in my mind instead, so he could read it behind my eyes. We made a camp in an old bear den just before the watercolor dawn. He held me close. Closer than he ever had. No stories that day. Just his arm on my waist and his breath in my hair. You've got a sunrise in your heart. He said as I closed my eyes. I woke at dusk and reached out for him. I found a note. Being fun, to think. But the lonely road is calling. Don't bother looking for me. If this life teach you one thing, it's how to stay hid. Adios. I was shaken. So mama was right. This is the way life is. I ran into the rocky hills. I found some city folk roughing it in an RV and I tore them into chunks. The red spilled into the sand and I didn't drink a drop. I could smell them in their veins. It's been days. He told me the hunger would make me crazy. But I don't feel a thing. There's another hunger eating away at me, turning me to dust from the inside out. The note was a lie, too. He said he rambles so low, but that ain't the truth. The truth was in his eyes that night when I almost said the word. Cowboy didn't fear nothing except that word. He was afraid I'd try to say it again. He wouldn't be able to stop me. He was afraid I'd say it, and it'd drop him dead quicker than a stake to the heart. Maybe he was right. I've made up my mind. After I set this down, I'm going to take a walk into the cool blue desert. I'm going to find a nice place to sit and watch. The yellow streaks over the mountains will burn my tears away, and I'll be carried off on a flare of light like a dream upon waking. If this world is the same all over, maybe it's different in the next. There's a sunrise in my heart, and I'm dying to dig it out. But if my cowboy ever sniffs you out in the dark, and spills your neck juice down his chin, tell him something with your last breath, will you? Tell him if there is another place. I'll be waiting there on the day when the sun catches up to it. Tell him that there's not. Then my ashes will ride the desert wind and search for him in the night. Tell him real hunger only gets worse the more you feed it. And I have been starving from the moment we met. And if he don't give you time for all that, just tell him one thing for me, will you? Tell him I love you.